Hey there, banditos. Welcome to a Wednesday episode of the Dollar Bin Bandits. I'm Mike Farah, and we have another great guest for you today. His name is Bob Shrek, and you know Bob as an editor in so many different companies, from Comico to Dark Horse, from DC to Oni Press. He has developed stories, he has developed talent, uh, many of whom and many of which we have discussed on this very program. So without further ado, let's hear his story. This is Bob Shrek. Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here, Michael. Looking forward to it. Great. Well, let's get started with the patented first question, which is how did you first discover comic books? Uh, well, I discovered them and then rejected them at first because I was, I was too old for them at age, I don't know, seven or eight. It's like, ah, I don't do that. That's not for me. And then I had a paper boy that delivered uh, our paper every, every day, which my brother and I tortured. Uh, just, you know, like ask him what he was collecting when he came to collect or he'd hear booming fight on the other side of the door and then suddenly a small hand shaking would come out and give him the money and uh, we just tortured him anyway uh his boss told him that he lived next door to a guy that made crazy horror movies and scared the bejesus out of his wife with monster makeup and that was me and then and larry did the same thing my buddy larry uh larry ruggiero and we met kind of like not wanting to really acknowledge each other and and the next thing we knew that Saturday, we wrote three horror movies, not one, three horror movies. And, uh, and we became best buds. And, and he asked me at some point, uh, hey, do you read comics? I was like, no, no way, no, you know. And then he just threw a book at me. He said, take this home. And I took it home. And it was a Marvel book. I remember that. I can't remember exactly what issue, but. I realized when I read it, whoa, this is weird. This is not a movie and it's not a book. It's a whole nother thing. And, and it was a lot better than the books that I saw when I was much younger. You know, the art was more appealing to me. So that was it. Larry is the one who infected me with this horrible disease. And I've been paying for it ever since. You, you were hooked, as they say. You bet. Do you um, still have whatever that first issue that uh, he handed to you? No, because my uh, my entire collection and my all of my records and all of my artwork that I was drawing, everything that I owned, burned in a fire that uh, hit our house. Uh, you know, I was about eighteen or nineteen years old. I was had to have been nineteen. It was the night after my birthday, and uh, I was standing out in front of my house. Well, it was on fire, naked, happy to see everyone. And uh, yeah, I had no idea that I was standing in the snow naked. And uh, uh, one neighbor came up and handed me his coat to give me a little privacy. <clears throat> and it only came to my waist. So uh, I looked like a complete and utter buffoon out there. But uh, everything was gone, including uh, my brother's uh, little doggy. Him and his wife had a little gory, uh, mm. little uh, uh, Scotty, and uh, he wanted, you know, he went back in to make sure everybody was out. Unfortunately, he didn't get out. But you know, it was a pretty heavy blow, and takes a while to get over. I think it took a week off from uh, work, but uh, yeah, that was tough. So, but it, you learn that nothing is permanent that you know life is i had a grandmother who hated change she just hated they changed the latin in the church and it's like it's just change grandma and she went i hate change i was like note to self if you want to avoid becoming a crabby old lady accept change so while that was a body blow it teaches you that anything that comes along after that is uh, survivable so very true as mm -hmm. they say the only thing permanent is change so exactly exactly um, I, I just had a friend post on facebook you know uh, life is weird or something like that and i just responded life is change 
<laughs> so very true. Um, so, okay. So you had this, uh, you know, formative experience of your friend, you know, sharing this comic book with you. Um, you had these tragic events uh, of the fire and I'm sure, you know, other experiences. When did you first know that you thought comics would be part of your career? Um, well, I was always, I was so lucky to be born where I was. I was out on Long Island, uh, 35, 40 minute train ride and I could go to any convention I wanted to. And Larry was the one who said, come on, you're coming with me. And we were definitely at the 1969 Suling Con for sure. I'm pretty sure I was at a few before that because I actually did volunteer for Phil Suling a couple of times, which made him uh, kind of bitter and angry when I started working at Creation. Um, but uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, it was kind of, I don't know. As I was doing those cons, I was just getting more and more immersed. I was making friends with people like, uh, uh, gosh, Tommy Yates, Steve Bissett, uh, just a whole, Bernie Wrights, and all those people were uh, at the very beginnings of their careers. And I was one of many fans sitting there going, oh my God, have you seen this? Have you, did you see that? Swamp Thing, of course, is just, that's it, if you ask Shrek. Anything that is dear and near, it's Swamp Thing. I just fell in love with that book. And uh, Len Wein was from my town, which is so weird. I didn't find out until 25 years later. Uh, and Bernie, I mean, we all became friends, you know, that, of, you know, I, I was a fan for a long time. And then they eventually said, all right, you're not, you're not too weird. We'll let you hang out with us, you know. But yeah, it was, um, you know, a kind of a small, slow evolution, but the weirdest thing that happened was I was in a cover band, which was a big thing back on the island during the time. There was a Yes cover band. There was a Led Zeppelin called cover band. And there was one band that was really big called Rat Race Choir. Uh, and they also, they did everything and they did tall. But our band, damn it, uh, we did pretty much tall and Rocky Horror. And that was it. We did a little Led Zeppelin, did it up. But uh, we were looking for a keyboard player as this band was starting. And having gone already, as Larry and I, to at least 10 creation cons, this guy walks up, he's got a keyboard, he's in the garage, he plays, he's fantastic, plays the opening as thick as a brick, and we're happy. And he, we say, okay, Adam, what's your name? And he says, Adam Malin. And my buddy Larry goes, uh, like from creation cons? And sure enough, he's like, yeah. So we're like, whoa, this is so weird. So Adam was in the band. And then as the band started to uh, not quite, you know, when disco came on, we were dead. That was the end <laughs> of it all. And we actually played one club. And I'm amazed we got out of there alive. Um, but uh, he, Adam got to know me. And then him and Gary, the two owners of Creation, offered me a job. And I started working for them. Oh, gosh, again, the year is hard to tell. 79, 78, I don't know. But um, so I started going into Manhattan, and they had an office right across the street from uh, Madison Square Garden right there on the corner. You, you didn't even have to go outside. You go underneath and up, and you're, you're at work. And uh, it was great. It was a really great <clears throat> introduction. And then that also allowed me to get to know more people because I was now booking flights for Archie Goodwin or Jim Shooter or whoever is coming to our convention in the netherworlds of, uh, of America. And then that just rolled into when I left the creation, um, Carol Kalish uh, hired me for someone else's department at Marvel Comics. And, uh, and it was because this woman, Lee Sapp, had quit and the convention season was just starting and I already knew 80% of the people that needed to get flown wherever they are. So I was, you know, Carol's booking agent. And then from there, just um, kept on going. Wow. That's a, that's an amazing origin. You know, I, I, I don't think we've heard anybody that has got into the industry through, 
conventions. I feel like the the the, the natural path has been mostly fanzines. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where you get to know a lot of the creative talent and then eventually kind of make your way into the into the books. So right. what was that? I mean, what was it like, um, you know, working your way through the conventions? It almost seems like an I, I dare say an easier way because you're already like from day one talking to, you know, some of your probably your heroes or some of the folks that you want to uh, work with. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you wind up going, uh, and one day you're in San Diego, one night you're in San Diego, you're on a boat, you have a dinner party of about 15 to 20 people. Uh, and uh, Jimmy Dewan is our main guest at the show. And uh, talking about classy guy, uh, creation paid for the food and he took up the bar bill. Um, so you have a lot of those nights where you're, you know, you're in your deli and you're hanging out and, you're hanging out with uh, Walter Koenig or whoever, or Bernie Wrightson, whoever, you know, you're like flipping out about and you're having a good time. And I, you know, Doris Day is sitting you know, a few feet away. We're just like, you know, comic book slobs. And it's like, well, we have money. <laughs> so, so bring me food, you know? Um, so yeah, it was crazy and it was great. You know, Archie Goodwin and I, I don't know how many shows we did together. And uh, we had, a, you know, and, and through all those shows, there are many strange adventures, <laughs> things occasionally get out of hand and people swear that they'll never tell. <laughs> I'm sure we could do a whole episode on just the, uh, the creation years and some oh, stories yeah. from that. Oh, um, yeah. But we'll, we'll, we'll move on for the time being. <laughs> um, um, you mentioned Marvel. So you had an early experience there coming off of your creation work um what exactly were you doing there it wasn't editorial at that point was it no 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 i was basically you know stepping in for lee sap this this gal who handled all of their travel and all of their uh creator liaisons whatever they needed to to, to handle folks so i came in there and you know i knew i already knew half of the people's you know seat preference and I knew that, oh, they're not going in this hotel. There's no way we can put so-and-so in this hotel. We got to put them in a nicer hotel. So I, I was a last minute addition. And Carol had her reason for also for hiring me. Marvel was about to do their 25th anniversary. <clears throat> and uh, Shooter was like, okay, we, we got to do something big. We're going to do something great. Da, da, da. So Carol basically asked me, if you were to be in charge of running conventions in various cities that year, uh, how would you do it? She basically wanted creation's algorithm and how they made money doing conventions and what you have to do at the hotel, the room nights and blah, blah, blah. And I gave it to her and, then, and apparently uh, she buried it somewhere. And it was supposed to go in front of uh, Jim Shooter for approval, and it didn't. And then Diana Schutz, who I had just recently met, and we were kind of, I think, falling in love around this time, she helped me co-write a kind of letter of, you know, please stay my, my, my death and let me stay here and do this project, you know, where I run all these shows for you. And finally, you know, and I sent that over to Jim and then he finally admitted that he would, not admitted, he allowed me to sit with him. And I went through it and he said, well, I read your proposal. I said, yeah. And he said, well, what I'm going to do, if Marvel's going to do something big, it's going to do something big. It's going to do something that makes San Diego look ridiculous. And I'm like, you know, I was this fan and oh, San Diego, it's the greatest place in the world. And it's like, well, it's kind of a petty thing to say about San Diego gone. And I did a swear to God, I said to him, Jim, if you want me to run a convention on the moon, you know, if you guys want a convention on the moon, you know that I'm the only one who can do it and do it right. Uh, and because he said, well, you can redo this proposal. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do this again. I'm your monkey once. And then that's after that, you know, you can go do it. So, yeah, I didn't get a stay of execution. I was let go. But it was about a year, year and a half. And during that time, I also did the retailer 
reach out stuff. I was doing, I can't even remember half of what it was, but it was, it was probably evil, but at the time I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a, a sort of travel booking and uh, possible convention stuff. And then also a little bit of kind of market, direct market. Uh, yeah. Direct yeah. Retailer market incentives. Marketing. Yeah. yeah. Retailer incentives, all that sort of thing. So, okay. but then I got the ax. <laughs> yeah. And um, okay, so then you made your way somehow, and I'd like to hear the story to Comico, uh, which I always have to think about pronouncing correctly, but Comico is correct, right? <laughs> it's the rising um, star on the you know of the on the stationery that uh, gave it away. Right. Um, yeah, well, that was me uh, being told to meet Jerry Giovinco, who was one of the. Uh, three main, well, of the four, the three main artists and, and creative types at Kaneko, who I had known for several years already because of my creation days. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, literally set up um, Jerry to go up and down the line of the uh, convention, especially in Philadelphia, where they would usually show up. And uh, he had a beautiful uh, Hulk, I'm sorry, uh, Ben Grimm, costume that he made out of foam rubber so he'd carry around a big plastic cigar and he'd go up and down the line and go hey how you doing da, da, da. and then we said okay if he does that we'll give you guys three tables and they'd get their three tables uh they used to do x ducks i'm not sure why i guess they were afraid of getting marvel mad so they would draw you as a duck as an x-men character yeah, I, I have an original Phil Flosorda X stuck at me with a, a big duck bill and a beard hanging off of it. It's very disturbing. Um, so anyway, that's how the whole thing came about. And um, uh, Phil Flosorda and his brother Dennis, Dennis was the money guy, they were all talking. Giovinco said, hey, you know, this guy, Bob Shrek, that we've known for a really long time, he knows his stuff in the market, and I like his his you know what he what he's gravitating to uh, in terms of comic book tastes and whatnot. So he came up to the con in New York and offered me a job, and I was like, oh yeah, because I didn't have one, you know. So I was like, okay, I'm ready to go, and and then I wound up uh, down in Philadelphia, which is a town I did a lot of shows in. So I was very familiar and I love that city. I would always call it my second city uh, until I wound up in San Francisco and then it became third. But, uh, <laughs> but and I did, you know, and then I lived outside at Kimi, you know, while at Kimiko for about five years. So it was a great time. We had a lot of fun. And it was you and uh, Diane, right, that were the, I mean, I guess you weren't the owners, of course, but you were kind of you had the vision for the company at that time um i think and we're sort of executing both at a well she was at an editorial i think you were marketing right um what it's so what was the vision sort of coming into kamiko we were all of a kinship of mind uh and that also goes to dc while diane and i working we were not working at dc at the time we were of the same mindset you know, I was, we knew Dick Giordano very well. I knew Paul Levitt since so I don't even want to say. Um, but we were of an editorial mindset of uh, changing things and making things more and more challenging and making them interesting. You know, what, what uh, DC did with the graphic novel, how, you know, geez, so, you know, look at, look at, it's called Dark Knight format which Marvel said for like, I don't know, two years went, why are we always promoting them when we mentioned the format of this book? It's like, yeah, that makes no sense, doofus. Um, so yeah, it just wound up being that we, we really super connected and Phil Lasorda was, uh, we were all really tight with Giordano, but Phil Lasorda in particular uh, was super tight with him. And, and so we had a lot of help. We had all these great people that would, uh, and oftentimes, you know, they all came to us saying, don't go on the newsstand. And we told them, oh, you're crazy. What are you talking about? 
Well, that's why Kamika went under. After everybody told us not to go on the newsstand, we went on the newsstand and it didn't go well. <laughs> so, uh, going going sort of sequentially here, as, yeah. as we like to do, um, then you, you know, you had a little interim here at um, Graffiti Designs, um, uh, but then you moved into Dark Horse. Um, mm -hmm. And I think uh, from what I've read, that that is where you became a little bit more directly involved with um, editorial. And so is that correct, first of all? Um, actually, I started doing uh, editorial while at Kimiko, uh, not only choosing uh, projects with the group, because it was all, you know, me, Diana, Phil, and Jerry, mostly, Um so I was I was right at all of those meetings and saying I don't think we can sell this or oh we should do this or we should do that, um, and while at Nico, uh, I I was helped by um, my good friend Michael Yuri on a book called Blood Scent, which was a story that my brother a short story my brother wrote. And I read it and said to myself, I'm going to just toss this over to Gene Colin and see if he thinks the writing is good. And he's like, Gene was such a sweetheart. He goes, you know, it reminded me of Matheson. He's like, holy jump. Now don't tell my brother. Uh, so uh, Blood Scent was a book that, uh, that I put together. And I was the uh, f first editor on Plastic Forks. Uh, Diana's like, you and Ted do this it's great we got the deal ted had put in uh, two episodes two books already and then i had to call him a little while after that second uh, came in and tell him that the company was going under and uh that conversation didn't last more than i think 30 seconds because i started to cry and he started to cry and i hung up and he hung up and we waited a day and then we got back on the phone. I think we made it half an hour the next day. And it was just uh, horrific uh, on all counts, particularly for Ted, because he had to go and resell it. Thankfully, he end ended up with uh, uh, Archie Goodwin. And uh, I forget who actually did edit that book there. But uh, he, un he wound up underneath Archie's domain at Marvel. And it, and it finally came out. It was a beautiful book. But anyway, that was my first grab at mm. it. And then when I came to uh, uh, Dark Horse, yeah, I was still called a marketing guy of some sort, whatever the name was. But it was very soon thereafter where they said, okay, you, you're going to handle all the, you know, creator-owned stuff. And so I not only ran the creator-owned group, but I brought in things that I thought were really cool. Well, yeah, I, I would say, and I, I think a lot of people uh, thought were very cool as well. I mean, you had um, things, uh, you know, things like, um, or, or people that you brought in or that developed there, like Mike Allred and Paul Pope, and you had titles like Madman and Sin City, um, uh, Monkey Man and O'Brien. Um this seems like a, almost a quantum leap forward. I mean, I know you were starting to do the, these things at Comico, and maybe it's just sort of with you know um, looking back on it now, you can see sort of the, the talent and the and these titles. But um, what was it like? I guess making that transition from maybe marketing to more of editorial, and then working on maybe not at that point you didn't think they were big books or they were going to be big books, but they turned out to be big books. What, what, right, you know, right. How was that big transition? It was, it was a natural one. It was fun. I, I, you know, most of the people, I mean, I've known Frank Miller a thousand years and, you know, all these folks, I've just, Hey, how's it going? And there's no, they're just high, nice, good people that are, you know, hello, how are you? Okay, fine. You know, um, so having that kind of barrier taken out a long time ago, it's it was no no problem whatsoever. The jo my job when you were working with the Frank Miller, yeah, I'm not going to tell him anything about Batman that he needs to know. It's it's silly, you know. Um, but uh, if he's doing something that 
like I had an instance with the uh, DK two where he just we went out and we talked and had lunch. And he told me this wonderful scene, and I was like, "Oh my god!" I almost I literally teared up when he told me the scene. And then later he's like, "Oh, I got rid of that whole thing because you know I think he's like what what he goes yeah no I have the better idea and then he told me the better idea and I just said I waited I think a day and then I got back and went I don't think so and here's why and he you know every time when you had a criticism Frank would go great okay good okay I'll call you tomorrow and that was it there was no, no long chat it was just I'm just I'm just saying you know and 99.9% .9 of the time you'd come back and go, all right, you know, I hear you, it's fine. Or you would just see when the pages come in, oh, oh, oh you got rid of it, that's great, because it was really bad idea. Um, there aren't many of them, but every now and then, and that's what he needs. He needs somebody to say to him, every good creator needs a good editor slash critic on their shoulder going, are you sure? Are you sure about that? Or what do you mean by that? What 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 do you what do you want me to feel about that? And uh, if they're on, they can, you know they can convince you. Oh no, I I missed it, but you're right. I see what you're doing. Then I shut my mouth. But if they can't support their claims, then I ask them to go home and think about it. You know. So, but yeah, I mean, Frank had this great, that great moment in DK2 where Gary Kelly has to have his, uh, the, the guy who screwed up, have his collarbone broken or whatever it was, she had to patch him up and take care of him. And the next thing she's crying. And the, the first time you see anything of Batman is this giant hand. Good girl, good soldier. And, you know, I still get tingles when I say it because it's a great move you know it's a great moment it's a great that relationship is boom it's right there you don't have to think about it it's okay i'm cool you know so um yeah that's it was fun it's it's a, it's a, there's a lot of work to it and there's a lot of bean counting type things which i'm not you know i'm not really good at and that's why i love all my assistants who go okay no i made sure it went out in the mail and, uh and i always try to call somebody the minute the pages arrive as long as planet earth allows you let them know it arrived and you try to consume enough of it that you can at least talk about something that you know the artist or writer artist did to kind of okay i'm going to show you see i can do this too and it's nice to let them know <laughs> i caught that and that was great or you know again there's other times when you say i don't know what that means and then they kind of squiggle around and then eventually get off the phone um but yeah it was it's it was a lot of fun watching these things grow and um you know when i was on a, a book that wasn't creator owned that was the fun of that is how can i how can i make this more interesting than just what is there uh i did a godzilla story that i'm very proud of i'm a huge godzilla freak i also love king kong but i'm a huge godzilla freak and uh i had a story in dark horse presents <clears throat> that uh dave cooper did the the art for i think he did the whole story i can't remember but uh it was written by brew baker and i think john lewis who did the who did the, the frog book well, i can't remember, true swamp right. and uh yeah and it was the zany wacky you know short story black and white and basically the punchline to the story is the reason why godzilla goes to you know, tokyo is because he's molting and he's rubbing his back and everything on this these buildings. And the happy ending is all the little Asian kids in town are swinging, you know, sliding down his fleshy glop and going, wee! And the guy in charge of the Toho material at the time, Saperstein, I think was his last name. I had this memo, what are you, you're out of your mind. What are you, you know? And so I call him and we talk and he goes, 
Godzilla is not funny. And I just let him hang. I <laughs> just let him hang. And he said, have you seen Son of Godzilla? Have you seen about 40% of Godzilla films? He gets his ball shot by King Ghidra. I mean, he falls over pagodas. He's a total clod. He tells Mothra and the rest of them to fuck. And I, I did say this, to fuck off on a hill because they want to go beat up King Ghidra. The little Japanese girls say, oh, he's using very bad language. Yeah. He's, <laughs> he says, fuck you. Um, and the guy started laughing and, went, and he said, all right, just do it. And then I got to do it. And it was like, you know, it's one of those achievements in, in comics that you have to take with pride. You know? <laughs> that is certainly a milestone. I mean, um, <laughs> Godzilla, I, you know, the, the whole the concept is pretty absurd. Like if you can't go to those places of humor with like an absurd concept of Godzilla, then like, you know. What on. is life? What is life? I say. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the new one. I think it's uh, from Japan. Uh, having oh, yeah, minus at, one. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's exactly, it's a tribute to the old one, the original, but uh, it's it really brings in new ideas and new thoughts. And and uh, my old, uh, one of my other great, loving, wonderful assistants, uh, Jamie Rich, He's pretty tough nut, you know. He's like, you know, he's very dead panny and you know. And I got a text from him saying that he saw the movie Godzilla Minus, and he cried. I was like, whoa, <laughs> whoa! They found a kink in the armor and Jake <laughs> Rich, um, which was great to hear because it's that type of a movie. If you're really watching it and paying attention, and you get over the fact that it has subtitles. You know, it's uh, it's. I thought it was one of the best things in the world. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. There's always something crazy happening, and I I, I just watched the uh, where I the where I used to work over at Legendary. I just watched the TV show that they have on Apple Plus, and I've heard good things. Monarch, uh, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, not so much. I felt like uh, Alec in. Uh, Clockwork Orange. I, I need to <laughs> please stop. <laughs> Not Ludwig. <laughs> Not Ludwig. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just hours of people talking. And uh, there's a thing in there. There's a kaiju in there that has all these like deer horns and horns all over it, all from out of it, all over. And the moment they say, ah, that was designed by a Hollywood executive. Just any artist wouldn't, would ne you yeah. know, you can just see the people having to, to build it going, stupid assholes. Or, <laughs> the dumbest looking thing I've ever seen. So anyway, you know, love to Legendary, but not my favorite show. Got it. Okay. <laughs> we'll put you down in the plus side for minus and uh <laughs> Minus side for Monarch. <laughs> uh, but these concepts, you know, these concepts are pretty malleable, I would say. And I don't, I don't think a lot of folks, well, you know, fans get so dug in um, mm -hmm. in how they think, you know, these properties should be. And without thinking like, you know, they're, they're, they're fictional, they're fictional concepts. They're, 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 they can be made to do whatever they want because they're not mm -hmm. real people or real characters or real situations so they'll, they'll get better yeah they'll, they'll get over it it's okay right. yeah yeah, yeah. They're, not, they're not here with us it's okay right. Right. <laughs> um so you you mentioned a lot in um in this past answer about uh, a little bit about how you approach um editorial and and the role of an editor um you know when did that sort of develop with you how you can work with um the creators to kind of get the best material out of them and speak you know truth to power as it were and be able to criticize and then you know uh, get get even better work out of them um i have to thank my middle my older brother dean who was the one who wrote that blood scent book uh, that um, gene colin did um i was uh, let's see, five, four years younger than him. 
And uh, he kind of gave me an education in film, uh, mostly horror at the time, uh, horror or detective films. And um, he was a, a struggling writer at the time. He was trying, he was writing, he was writing poetry and he was writing short stories. And I was his, you know, guinea pig. I was his test rabbit. And it's like, well, what do you think of this? And what do you think of that? And so I would literally go through his either his poem or mostly his short stories and go, uh, this is too, she wouldn't say that. That's not, that's him saying it. And that's you saying it. So get that out. Um, so eventually through years of this kind of you know, quizzing from my older brother, uh, and again, like I said, going to really great, I mean, every now and then we call it a really bad movie, but we were lucky there were a lot of great movies coming out at the time uh, when uh, when we were going. And, uh, you know, Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, which I should, I was too young to see, but I, I ate it up. If you haven't seen Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, definitely check it out. Um, Betty Davis. Um, so anyway, um, so I think through the, his kind of weaning me on these these stories and me working with him on his stories that kind of gave me a, 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 some kind of a taste of oh this works and that doesn't I, ha I have an ear for um how people talk and when uh, when there's a piece of dialogue that comes in like I just saw uh the holdovers and there's some really nice stuff in it, but then there's some moments where you got, what? They, there were no scissors in the room. There were nothing there to cut the scene out because you're making this person look horrible. Um, and most of the times they were very good, but man, you know. Um, so yeah, I just, I developed this knack of being able to smell a good story and uh, read something as a brief synopsis and say, Okay, I, I see where you're going. I'm not sure. You know, when I read Sweet Tooth, it didn't have all of what Sweet Tooth is now. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, maybe five pages of, of a pitch, <clears throat> which I thought he was jerking me around because the cover of a pitch was a boy in a plaid shirt eating a candy bar with horns on his head. And I looked at Brandon Moncler, my assistant at the time, and said, He's messing with us. He's got to be messing with us. What are we going to do this? And then, boom, you read the first paragraph, and then you read the pitch underneath, and you're sitting there looking, me and Brandon are looking at each other like, we have to do this. This is crazy. And thankfully, Karen Berger did the same thing. You know, I literally left. I had Brandon leave it on her desk and didn't say who left it there. I knew she'd know it was me and Brandon. And she walked up and put her, leaned up against our doorstop and just put the pitch in her hand and went, we have to do this, don't we? We're like, yes, thank you so much. It was so great. And uh, and the rest is history. You know, Jeff, you know, I'm waiting for my third appearance in the Sweet Tooth episode uh, series uh, number three. So, um, yeah, it's just uh, those are fun, fun days, you know. There are, like I said, there are a lot of other days when you just want to kill somebody, but you know, it's the fun ones that, that pull you through. Yeah, it must be immensely, you know, fulfilling to think back on, um, for instance, Sweet Tooth, and like when you saw a kernel of an idea mm -hmm. um, that was going to be maybe a comic book, and then to uh, eventually come not only to get through you know, a certain sequence of, of comic books, but then have it adapted and, you know, see something that, you know, started so small yeah, just, uh, yeah. become so big. Yeah. And again, I, I know I didn't, I didn't find Jeff Lemire. <clears throat> sure. I mean, I, I found him on my own when I read uh, uh, the Essex County trilogy and, and mm -hmm. was in love with his work. And then uh, Brett Warnock, um, I'm going to thank on the name of the company, but um, he pulled me over and said, "Look, I can't pay these guys any money, uh, and you've you know." And I was just new to Vertigo, and he's like, "Well, why?" And I said, "I love this work; it's great." Yeah, so that was it. I called him up, and bingo, bango, you know, it came together. Um, so yeah, it's all 
this kind of weird tornado of information and and if you're if you're on top of it you can reach out and grab a few things before you're swept up and thrown into oblivion <laughs> so uh we've been talking a lot of um well, we started with Dark Horse and talking a lot of DC Vertigo, which I want to get to more of. But in between the two, um, you had this venture of Oni Press, which okay. was a uh, publishing company that you uh, basically co-created, right? Um, mm -hmm. What was the impetus behind that? And how did you make the decision to kind of strike out on your own, having been, you know, at that point, so successful at Dark Horse? Um desperation i guess um i had come to the my limits at dark horse it was just when diana and i got there there were i think eight people working there maybe 10 and we made it 10 or 12 whatever it was very small all in one little room and then towards the end there were 125 employees most of which i didn't know and I kept saying to Mike Richardson, we need badges or tags or something, because I don't know who I'm letting in the side door over here. So, um, and there were other complications, which I don't need to go into right now. It's too long and boring, but um, had had a very long friendship with another younger player, Joe Nosmack, who mm -hmm. I met in San Diego when he was, 18 or 17 i don't know how old he was very young and he flew around a lot because his stepmother worked at some airline so he just paid the tax and said i'm going to san diego you know he's from uh, texas so i met him and became we became friends uh he's a huge matt wagner fan and so we had all sorts of you know and the, the friendship just grew as the years went on. And all the next thing I knew, we were hanging out more and more. And, and it, uh, I got, he got hired at Dark Horse for the marketing department um, and uh, wasn't treated very well there by the woman in charge of the marketing department. And uh, he was let go, but he was already here in Portland. So we hung out and as things got crazy and then I quit, we looked at each other and went, hey, um, are we both stupid enough to, to do this? And uh, he had some finance financing that he available to him. And uh, his, uh, his, his stepfather said to him, hey, you know, because at the time the market wasn't really great. Hey, now's the time to get in, which we thought, no, don't go in. The market, market's early down. He goes, yeah, but the market is down. It comes back up. So we got lucky with that. And um, uh, so we started up Oni and we, you know, again, the, the great, sweet people that are out there taking care of us at the time. You know, I get a call. Well, I got a call from his agent at the time or his lawyer uh, saying, Frank Miller wants you to have bad boy that uh, Simon Bisley illustrated for a European magazine. And uh, he doesn't want any money. All you got to do is pay uh, Simon for the cover. And I, I tried to negotiate him down. No, I didn't. I said, <laughs> yeah, let's go. Um, so uh, that was one of our very first. And at the same time, uh, I had already been infected by Kevin Smith who, when I was at Dark Horse, you'll love this little tale, I wanted to put him in DHP, and Kevin was ready to go. And Mike Richardson said, Bob, I have three daughters, and I'm not going to publish Kevin Smith, because Kevin Smith promotes drug abuse. My, my hand to whatever being is out in the cosmos, <laughs> I said, I swear I said this, I said, Mike, you're wrong. Life promotes drug abuse. And I walked out of his office. So I, I, he might not have gotten that. I don't know. But, uh, but oddly enough, now, gee, look at this. 20 years later, whatever it is, Kevin Smith is being published by Mike Richardson. So I, have to, <laughs> I haven't picked up the book, but if there's any drug references in there, I'll be furious. <laughs> I hope his daughters are not offended. 
<laughs> yeah, they're, they're in their late 20s and 30s now so uh that so that answered a follow-up question which was you know how did how did your association with kevin smith come about and it seems like uh, you you were already in his orbit around the dark horse years and once you yeah. sort of got the freedom to uh do what you want you brought him brought him on to oni absolutely and that's what happened when oni started joe nosmack kind of punched me and said call him now and I was like, no, I'm afraid. And I called him and he literally that phone call, he said, go to the airport tomorrow morning. I'll send you the information and get on a plane and come out here. And I flew out to uh, view Askew headquarters and hung out with him and Scott Mosier and, and Monica, who was like at the time that she was dating Scott. And she, she's her, her and I are still very close. I'm close with everybody, but Monica and I talk a lot more. Um, but yeah, I was there hanging out and the next thing I knew we were, we were going to be doing clerks. So, um, you know, again, it's all the, it's the same thing with Judd Winnick, you know, we're at San Diego con and he walks up to the Oni table and all we had was a poster for bad boy and stickers, Matt Wagner art stickers of, of, uh, clerks or Jane silent Bob and clerks. And this guy walks up and I look at him and I immediately know who he is because I love the, the show. Yeah. And the weirdest thing for me is that he looks at me like he knows me. So I'm like, <laughs> what the hell is that about? Right. So we say, let's get lunch. And we go to lunch and he's like, I got to stop you. And I go, what? what? And he goes, I know you. I've read every Grendel comic. I've read so many Kamika books. I remember that that uh, purple suit you wore to Matt and Barb's wedding. It was like in Montreal. You weren't even there. It's like yeah, it was published in in Kimiko. So it was very creepy, and it worked out great. We were, <laughs> this is great. We know each other. Let's go. And he his first story he did in Only Double Feature got an Eisner nomination, which was like well that. Sometimes that's, that's that's not a good thing. You want to wait a little longer, but you know, I mean, and look at where Judd is now. He's he's still killing it. You know, he's doing what he loves, and he's getting paid for it, and that's it. You know, you got that combination. You know, it works. <laughs> it it seems like part of this, and I always get to this point with a lot of creators and editors, um, where you know you can't underestimate, I think, a little bit of luck in in how things work out, you know, uh, the stars aligning, you know, it wasn't so much that, you know, it, it's almost like, Judd, it's from what, you, what you're telling, Judd fell in your lap. <laughs> yeah, he walked up to the booth, yeah, and said, hey, he was, he was looking for a place to be published. Right. So he was, he was, that's what he did that whole con was go from one publisher to the other. And we were, you know, I looked at Joe, he looked at me and said, yeah, let's work with him. And boom, you know. And so, yeah, um, again, being born where I was, being able to get into Manhattan as easily as I could. Um, my dad wasn't exactly the most reinforcing positive influence in my, in my life. Uh, he would always say to me, you know, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the line. You know, uh, I, I would say to him, dad, I... I use you as an example of, you know, how I live my life. I just flip it <laughs> because he was miserable. He hated his job. He didn't really want to be around with his wife and kids. I mean, he was there for us, but it wasn't. Uh, when you find out at age four or five what a leech is and you are leech number four, <laughs> you kind of like, oh, I'm leech number four, you know, starting with mom and down, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I credit him for realizing I don't want to do that. I don't want, he wanted me in the, he was a cop. He wanted me to go to a more real safe public kind of job. And I was like, uh, I'd rather eat glass. So I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, there are, there are motiv motivators outside of uh, just the creative one. And, mm -hmm. you know, Certainly family can be one of them. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in another one of your um, 
transitions. And and first of all, I mean, even just up till now, I, I mean, you were at Creation, Com- Comico, I almost did it again. Uh, Dark Horse uh, started your own company with Oni, which, you know, received lots of acc- accolades. So even up to now, I mean, wh- wh- what a trajectory. And then you move on to um, DC uh, and then had an amazing, you know, an, another amazing uh, stint there, a uh, long stint there. Um, so coming from um, Oni, where you had, you know, you co-created the company, you have a lot of, um, a lot of control, you have a lot of freedom. Um, and not to say you, you you didn't have that subsequently, but how did you make the decision to move from Oni to uh, DC, which is obviously a more corporate gig. They made me an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> um, they had been trying to, Dick Giordano, the first day I started it, started in DC, I had two messages on my, my phone because nobody knew, you know. Uh, the first one was uh, Pat Bastian, I believe, Calling, calling for Dick Giordano. She was his assistant for many, many years. I knew them both very well. They were sweethearts. And it was Pat saying, Hi, Bob. It's Pat. Um, congratulations. We finally got you. And it's like, oh, because they had offered me many times. And then the second call I got was from Neil Gaiman saying, hey, we should do something together. Uh, I wasn't going to do an English accent. Um, <laughs> so, and we did. We did Good a book deal. So, um, so uh, yeah, um, it was not that terrible. Uh, you know, not that terrible to transition over to it. Um, I did get a call. I was heading into my house, which is where Oni was stationed, and uh, there was a voicemail, and Jamie was Rich, Rich was there, and it was Benny O'Neill saying, "You know, please call me. I'd like to talk to you." Uh, long story short, they uh, flew me out and f- took me to dinner and offered me a dollar number that was way less than what I was offered five years prior. So I just said, you want me to live in New York State on that? No. So they ponied up. They paid me well. And, uh, and I knew it was a good career move. And I, you know, I also knew that I, I, I knew that they knew that if I came on board, maybe one or two of my friends would come with me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that was, that was that, you know, I was like, uh, trying to remember what Frank said. Oh, yeah, I got a call from Frank and said, Hey, Shrek, you want to go on a suicide run? <laughs> And he was right. I want the first Dark Knight. You know, shut up and take what you get. Um, yeah. So, and he was right. Like I said, I mean, everybody all squabbled, and, and but they all bought ten copies. So it's like, okay, well, thank you very much. It was a huge success. And I, I love that book. I don't know what, what their problem was. But again, their problem was they wanted to go back home, and the home is gone. Yeah. Change read the, again. Read, yeah. Read Nobody the book wants that, change. Nobody wants change. How dare they? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, you know, of course, Frank and several others, you know, and Matt Wagner, who had always had a good relationship with DC. Uh, we had already just done the Kimiko DC Batman Grendel. Uh, and again, there was all these years of knowing everybody at DC, uh, even though when I got there physically, Pat and, and uh, Dick Giordano were gone, um, so it was it was it was a great time. There were lots of it was a mellow time in the beginning because I was just editing books, and then they hand, they handed the key to the Bat Group to me, and that was stressful because uh, Denny O'Neill, or maybe Denny's minions at the time, who all left the minute I got hired, they just like we're out of here. This guy's a nut. Um, Because I don't, you know, I don't care. All I know is that George Washington had wooden teeth. I don't want to count them. It's not that exciting and important to me. I haven't seen every Godzilla movie. Shh, don't tell everybody. It's, I don't need that minutiae in my head. I'd rather 
be a, a more open door. So anyway, yeah. So there were a lot of these little time bombs that were set to go off when Benny and his crew left and Carlin would love to, you guys got to fix that. It's like, but, 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 but he did it. Well, he's not here anymore. It's like, oh, yeah, but don't yell at me because <laughs> this guy over here left the time bomb. And I'm not saying that they actually intentionally did, but there are things that you, you start to do and then you forget to finish as an editor, mm -hmm. if you're leaving and then something explodes and you're just happy you're home. Mm, interesting. Did yeah. I I yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You did. Um, and, and, you know, kind of leads into my, my follow up there, which was because, you know, you were in charge of the Batman books. It sounds like <laughs> your approach, and I was just going to ask you what your approach was, but on one hand, it was, it seemed to be cleaning up messes uh, to a certain degree that that were left over from previous uh, regime mm -hmm. but also on the other hand it was um bringing in you know top level talent to tell stories within the batman universe or, or right. their versions of, of batman it was sort of like just some creator driven stories about yeah. batman it wasn't maybe a, an overarching like well, Batman's generally going to be doing this. It's no, like, here, let's yeah, do yeah. some, you know, take the toy off the shelf for this person and see what they do. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, the uh, the uh, Scott Morse book uh, that I did with Batman, uh, I, I got it through so fast because Carlin accidentally saw a couple of pages at San Diego that were brought to me to go, Hey, can I do this? You know, it's called a room full of strangers. And, uh, and Carlin was like, Oh my God, I hope you're using that. And I was like, yes, I'm good. Oh, what do you, you mean? It might've been the, that might've been the Robin story and Batman in the dark, you know, black and white. But anyway, it was a, it was a kind of a good welcoming that he saw some of Scott's work before I wanted to do the whole book. And, uh, and the funny thing is that I had trouble getting it approved because uh, someone in the other department demanded that he get paid like a lot of money. And it was already like, okay, we're going to pay you this. So I had to go to them and say, well, we're going to pay him all this money. So it finally got resolved. Um, and, uh, the funny part of that is it was finished and uh, it had been lying around for a long time because we didn't want to go to Paul Levitt's and hi, here's a book that's done, but we don't have any vouchers for, and we got to pay him a lot of money. Um, and both Carlin and I love both of these guys. They were amazing and sweet to work with and beyond helpful in my career, especially Paul. Um, they both gave me their notes on the story to make it better. <clears throat> and they both said it, it needed uh, it needed a little more Batman. And that story absolutely pivoted on no Batman, except till the end. And that's why it worked. And I ignored them and I let it play exactly the way it was. Scott Butt got paid well. He gets paid better at Pixar, but he got paid well. And uh, the book won for the best single issue of the year. So clearly I have no idea what I'm doing. And, uh, and Scott's a moron. <laughs> it's like, whatever. You know, thanks for the notes, guys. Um, they, they read it wrong or whatever. You know, they, were, they were just off that day. So anyway, that's that. But yeah, it was, it was great fun. It was great fun bringing in people that were not normally uh, uh, in that universe. Uh, and it, it upset a lot of the older timers that were there. And it's like, I mean, you had your time in the sun. I, I, know, I had friend, a lot of friends that I'd love to uh, have worked with, but I'm in this market now at the time, and I need to figure out what's going to make the company happy. And uh, so I tried to do my best, but, you know, I'm sure I felt a lot of ways, but, you know, no, no use in crying over spilled milk.
Um, and you you obviously quickly expanded, and I don't know how quickly it was, but uh, you know, from the Batman um, titles to beyond Batman at DC, and then uh, you know, Green, Green Arrow, Green Lanterns, uh, All Star Superman, things of that nature, and then also um, Vertigo, as you mentioned. Um, yeah. I mean, all all great stuff. It seems like Vertigo maybe more. Uh, I don't know, felt like more up your alley? Did you feel like you, when you came into DC that you would eventually want to work at Vertigo or is it just sort um, of a happy accident? <laughs> no, well, it was, uh, it was an accident, but it wasn't a happy one. Uh, <laughs> you'll recall uh, All-Star Batman and Robin. I do recall that. And that's how I wound up in Vertigo. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, so yeah you know you take it you know you you're the editor and you take the heat there are a lot of other circumstances that went on then but i didn't i didn't fight i just went yeah okay it's time for me to go um and then another horrible moment in my life frank miller i well, i went to idw but frank miller calls me later and says hey you want to go work at legendary he's like oh no go away leave me alone i'm not interested um, and I was real excited for that first Godzilla movie they were doing. It looked great, but uh, didn't live up to the trailer, I thought. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, um, Josh, I'm sorry. Where was I? Oh, you were, well, you were talking about Frank Miller and IDW. I was we were talking yeah. about Vertigo. Um, right. As well. yeah. yeah, so that was the reason why I went to Vertigo was because of the screw up on uh, the Batman book. And uh, so they said, all right, let's shunt him over here. And uh, actually, no way. Yeah, something like that. Some combination of that. And then while I was at Vertigo, uh, it, I guess it printed and then it got it got bad. But I, I, I had a great time. Um, is it something that I lean to? Yeah, because I don't have years of continuity right. to worry about. And by pissing off some, some person in Taiwan that I did something wrong with Robin. It's like, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't write it. That guy did. Um, so, yeah, it was more freeing you could do. And I had been swimming in that world for years, you know. Uh, big fan of Evan Varkin, Ted McKeever, all, all the crazies, you know, Ed Brubaker. I worked with at, uh, at Dark Horse. And so, um, so yeah, there there are a lot of, a lot of opportunities. There were good opportunities in the in the back group, but uh, there were a lot more um, varied books to do. There's one that I had with Greg Ruth, and if you don't know Greg Ruth's work, R U T H, Greg. Mm. I don't actually. He's just a genius of a, of a writer and an illustrator. He's just amazing. I had a whole book ready to go. This whole weird, crazy story, and it. They got killed, and those are the ones that hurt. It's like, yeah. you know, you're already in it. You're like, wow, this is great. I can't wait to see what you do with more, and, and uh, then it goes away. And so there's these kind of stories just floating in your back of the head, in your back of your head, and you know, every now and then I, I should call Greg and just give him two hours. Just let me hear two hours worth of what you were gonna do, you know. But I'm sure he's completely moved on. So. Yeah, I mean, in in a, in a career as um, long as an, and engaging as yours, I'm sure you have you know these very high highs and sometimes these low lows or some disappointments that uh, oh, yeah. ones that got away almost. Oh yeah, um, uh, or, or we, were shot down not not through any you know. Oh yeah, no, some, yeah. Sometimes you know people just get that's it i'm not gonna let this happen i uh one of my favorite memories was san diego expo for the retailers and this was while carol kalich was alive and obviously and uh i was putting up a piece of poster a big poster for a book that we were we just got the license to do and carol happened to be walking by as i was putting up this big poster and she looked at it and she, it just didn't connect with her that we were at the show and it, it was going to be published by Kamiko. It just, she just looked, she just looked at it and it was a big Max Headroom poster. And she went, you know, 
then she got mad at herself. It's like, yeah, we already got it. Sorry, honey. You know, it's like early bird, honey. I was I was on this the minute I saw a picture this big in New York, New Yorker magazine, whatever it was. And I chased that thing down. It's like, what is this? I had no idea about the, the show in England yet. It was all new to me. So that was that was fun. And then what happens later is they kill it. We get it drawn. We get it written by Mike Barron. We get it drawn by the Panda Brothers. It was going to be 3D so that uh, Ray Zone was going to make the Panda Brothers 3D image, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, when when the original company, Hamilton Projects, sold it to Coke, Coca-Cola destroyed. I don't know if you saw Max Hedrum on HBO, but he made jokes about breasts. Ooh. Oh my goodness. We're going to have to bleep that. Yeah, I mean, nothing to do with the original character. Just a bunch of stupidity. And they killed it. Mm. They killed the book and they killed the, the character, you know. So so those are the, the travails, you know. And there are worse stories, trust me. <laughs> well, I, I want to give you an opportunity as uh, we start to wrap up to uh, I, I like to bring forward, if you have a couple of I don't want to say overlooked books or overlooked stories, but maybe ones that from your career that you're particularly proud of, but that didn't get sort of the attention that, um, you know, some of the, the big ones that we talked about did. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, Johnny Dynamite always comes to mind, which okay. was a fun, fun book uh, by Terry Beatty. And uh, gosh, I'm trying to remember who wrote it. The Terry Bader. Anyway, uh, yeah, the Johnny Dynamite had beautiful Mitch O'Connell covers, and uh, it was just a beautiful book and lots of fun and you know, kind of very reminiscent of um, oh, what's that movie with uh, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mess up on it. Um, kind of a, it mixes the mob with the with vampires, so. Um, uh, there's a Harryhausen cl clip in the movie. It's a John Landis movie. I can't remember the name of it. Um, but uh, yeah, so th let's see, what else? Uh, well, Gumby was a hit, and I didn't edit that, Diana did, but that was kind of our book, our idea. And it, uh, it sold really well for the time, there's no doubt about it. But it just kills me that if if uh, Scholastic or somebody that is a little less jittery, I mean, there's few moments in that book that are a little, you know, oh, my five-year-old can't read this, but mm. not much. And just it annoys the heck out of me that a collection of both of those, you know, the winter and the summer collection in a nice square bound in a nice bookstore. It just kills you. <laughs> it's just sitting there, and it's so much fun. Bob Burton yeah. and Steve Purcell. I mean, everybody did a great job. So, so it's those types of books that you you know they're they again. I mean, Grun Gumby was great. I had a great time marketing it. And we had a lot of fun, and it did really well. But it could have sold a trillion more copies. So, <laughs> but yeah, you know, there's always that book that that you love dearly. You know. Uh, same thing with the Eddie Current reprint, you know, we're like, okay, we're going to get Eddie Current reprinted at the Dark Horse. And, you know, not many people came to that party. But uh, I'm sure the hardcores were like, oh yeah, I have them all, so I don't need this. I had a great cover. So, but yeah, that's about all. I mean, there's a whole mess of horrible nightmares that you just want to forget. Um, yeah. Well, we won't yeah. talk about this. No, <laughs> and we'll let people hopefully uh, rediscover the uh, the ones you just mentioned because you know there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of gems out there that have already come out. You know, obviously people are looking for new stuff, but um, right, I right, like to go it's back cool. and some, sometimes yeah. you find stuff that's already come out that's that's great that just has kind of been passed by to a certain degree. Yep, yep, yep. so. Last um, uh, big question, and you kind of you kind of answered it throughout, and we we touched on it all already. But I'd like to hear from you. You know, what do you think 
or, or what are the qualities that make for a successful editor? Hmm. An editor has to be many, many things. Uh, sometimes a money lender, sometimes a psychologist, or at least referring someone to a psychologist. Um, most, for me, more importantly, I, I'm very blessed I can read the room. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's important to, when you're not even in the room, to kind of put your feelers out. I'll just tell a quick story. Um, Judd Winnick was really late on a Green Lantern, like really late, like embarrassingly late. And he's never done anything like that before. He was always on time or early. And uh, I was, you know, I was getting a little perturbed. I was getting a little nervous. I was getting a little whacked out. And then I, just before I called him, I went, all right, this is not normal. So just relax. Just call him, say, hey, how you doing? What's going on? You know, it's just a friendly call. Don't say anything. Even though he's going to be like, oh, no, he's calling. He's calling about this. And I don't bring it up. I do not bring up the fact that he is like three weeks later, whatever it is. And he eventually, during the conversation, he breaks. And he says, well, I've been really distracted. My uncle, who is basically the second father to me, is in Israel, and he just had a heart attack, and we're flipping out, and we don't know what's going to go on, and da, da 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 And we just talked for another half hour, 45 minutes. I said goodbye. He said goodbye. And I got the script two days later. And I didn't have any screaming or yelling or anything like that. It was just, leave the guy alone. He knows. He knows he's late. Let's just talk. Let's just hang out. Kind of bring down the tension. And it was, you know, it was great to hear that there was something really, really, I mean, it was horrible to hear, but it was understanding to me, like, wow, this is big. It's basically his father is dying and he's thousands of miles away and he can't get there and uh you know some things are worth it and some things are not you know and a, a, it wouldn't be dc's first late book uh which the only person that made me late was kevin smith back at kamiko i'm sorry back at dark horse what am i saying at Oni, Oni, uh, yeah, yeah, at Oni, he he completely screwed me over on that series with uh, uh, Duncan Figredo, and Duncan Figredo hates me to this day, and I love him, and I'm so sorry everything went crazy, but yeah, uh, that was horrible. But I fixed Kevin for Green Arrow, so <laughs> give me a little time, and I'll fix you. And we're back. What did you guys think of that? interview. I really enjoyed talking to Bob. So many more places we could have gone with this interview because he's been around and doing great work for decades and uh, a lot of influential work, as I said in the beginning. And it's really a testament to his editorial guidance, I guess, editorial prowess that uh, he's been able to shepherd so many stories, so many different uh, new and exciting projects into the comics world. So uh, we thank him for being on the program. We thank you for listening and viewing. Uh, remember, Ithacon is coming up at the end of this month of April. So please check that out. Uh, remember to rate, review, and subscribe and support our show in any way you can. We appreciate it and we'll see you next issue.